Hi, welcome back to the breadboard. In the previous video, we looked at the Revolution Pi Connect and Revolution Pi Core 3 and associated I.O. modules, but we didn't go further than that. We just looked at specifications, uh, had a look inside them, how they were built, etc., etc. I'll give you a little bit of a teaser about what is to come. In this video, I want to take you through some very important initial steps. That is, backing up your firmware, um, including specific configuration files that would be important to the base configuration of the modules. Uh, reloading the firmware, and I'm going to use the example of upgrading to the latest uh, release from Kunbus of the Raspbian firmware. It's not the light version, it's still the full-blown Raspbian, so you can have desktop and everything else if you want to. And take you through initial configuration steps, which are required when you load in a fresh uh, firmware image. So you need to be able to set things like passwords, the MAC address, and if you're using the RevPy Connect, um, you still just set one MAC address, but it will automatically set up the next one. It uses some of this information to create the default passwords as well, so you need to make sure you do it correctly. Once you've done that, then I'll take you through a typical module configuration, and once we're done there, I'll also show you how to grab specific files from your image so that if you do have to reload firmware from scratch um, without causing yourself too much problems and having to recreate everything there are a couple of files that you can actually put um, elsewhere that just keep a backup of them so that when you've done your image you can just load these back in again and you'll be back to where you were as far as your module configuration and things like that now uh, first thing I'm going to use a RevPy Core 3 as the example here because I've got some um, things set up on the RevPy Connect already for an upcoming video. Uh, the process is exactly the same, the only difference being that when you do the Revolution Pi Connect, it will just automatically set the second MAC address for you based on the first MAC address that you provide to it. Okay, um, so let's get to doing that. Okay, so the first thing you need to understand when you're going to do either a firmware update or create a backup of the image uh, of your Revolution Pi Core 3 or your Core or your RevPi Connect is there is going to be a situation where you have to take your device offline. So in this image you can see here, this is a picture taken from the control panel that I've built up and I've just focused in on the RevPi Core 3 uh, system that's on there. You can see here um, right below the Ethernet connector I've got a USB um, micro connector plugged in and when you power up any of the core modules or the connect module with this cable plugged in and plugged into your computer it will not boot into the normal runtime. It'll go into a programming mode. And there's a small Windows application that you run on a Windows machine that will then present the image that's in the EMS EMMC flash to your computer as a uh, you know USB drive slash hard drive. <clears throat> so what I've done is I've plugged in my computer to this port and I've repowered the Revolution Pi Core 3, so it is now sitting there waiting in uh, that mode for me to either program it or back it up. Important thing to note here too that you will need when you're doing the configuration is the MAC address of the port. On the RevPi Core 3 Connect, you'll have two MAC addresses, but the only difference is that uh, for instance here it ends with 1246. The second port would be 1247 in the case of the RevPi Connect. So this is our starting point. We have plugged in the micro USB. We have power cycled the RevPi Core 3. It is now waiting for us to either upload or back up its firmware image. On the Kunbus website, there is an extensive range of tutorials and how-tos, including how to install uh, new firmware, including Jesse, Wheezy, and right now they're up to 
uh, installing Stretch. So what you can do is you go to how to install Jesse. So the, the basic quick start is under tutorials and you just navigate to the images install Jesse. Once you're there, you can see it just basically has the complete process here, which we're going to go flow through, but I'm going to actually show you in video. And I'll do a summary of this, but provide links to this page for you so that you can follow along as well. There are three files that you need to download. One is the actual flash image itself, Raspbian. One is the RPI boot, which is a Windows application that allows you to present the EMMC flash memory as a hard drive to your Windows machine. And finally, Win32 Disk Imager. Uh, you could probably use Etcher or something else as well, um, but in here they're recommending Windows32 Disk Imager, so that's what I'm going to use. So the first thing we'll do is go into Store. You can go to Software, and here's all the different versions of things that you can download. So we'll go into the Stretch folder because that's what we want. And if we look at this, this is compatible with the RevPy Core 3 and the RevPy Connect. If you want the RevPy Core, I believe that you would go into the Jesse and there is a, yeah, there's a RevPy Core based on Jesse for that image. Looks like the later one is not compatible. So let's go back into Stretch. Now I've already downloaded the version that I need. Um, but you would just click on the link once you've logged in. Um, it would start the download like that, and away you go. So the next piece of software you need is the software to allow you to flash the compute module. Now this one is actually directly from the raspberrypi.org uh, website right here. So run the Windows installer, so you just click on this link. It'll download RPI boot setup.exe. Um, once that's downloaded, you just put a link on your desktop if it doesn't create one for you, and it will actually set up the USB slave port so that you can talk to the EMMC flash memory. And finally, Windows 32 Disk Imager, um, which can actually do the flashing for you. So I've got all these things down. Let's go to the Windows desktop and go through the process. Okay, so I've got my images ready. I've got the Raspberry Pi boot code, Win32 disk imager, and I've put the um, downloaded Raspbian stretch into my Conbus folder, ready for picking up to flash to the image. But any sensible engineer doing this will make a backup of what they have first before they continue. And there are a couple of important things to do if you want to be able to um, bring back your image and configuration quickly and uh, simply. So the first thing is if you can't see the module easily, um, there are two places where you can pick up the MAC address from. One, I've already shown you, it's on the front panel. The second one is in the Pi boot folder um, so if you're actually operating, you can grab it through the um, root boot config.txt file. And if you've already run the RevPy boot, then you can grab it from the, um, in my case, F drive that gets presented to you that has all of the files that would be uh, backed up that constitute the full image. The first thing we need to do is run RPI boot so that we can get the hard drive presented to us. So the controller has just been powered up and if I show you my drives here you'll see that while I have a lot of drives I don't have one that is um, something and named boot which is what it will be. So I'll run Raspberry Pi boot hopefully it will come up on the right correct screen if not I'll quickly try and move it into view. So it's connecting to the BMC controller and started up the bootloader and now we have a bunch of messages. Do not format the disk. It will present two drives to you and you're only interested in the one that is readable. So here we are. In my case it's come up as drive F and in here you can see we've got the config.txt and if we look at this uh, we'll see at the bottom 
it's got the MAC address. So most of the MAC address is in this Ether MAC high, and then the last bit is in the Ether MAC low. This is the same as what is on the front panel of your device. So if during the uh, initial configuration process you get this wrong, you can come into this file, which once you're running would be in uh, slash boot slash and then the config.txt and you could change it restart and then you'll have your mac address set correctly again so you get another file which is actually if you've already created a module configuration called config.rsc if you want to be able to easily restore it rather than handcraft everything again you need to back up config.rsc so that you can restore it again later now i've put the name and the type of the system that it came from in front of it but it's normally just called config.rsc so if you've got a lot of things in there it might be worth it if you really haven't done much it's, you know your mileage will vary it's up to you now where is that pile where is that file located it's actually in slash etc slash rev pi and then you'll see the config.rsc it looks like it's a link file but if you i'm using um win scp to go through to my devices but if you just double click on it you can have a look you can see it's a great big long wide file here but if I load it up in something like Visual Studio Code it will make a lot more sense so let me just load it up format there we go okay good sorry they're a bit rusty doing that so you can see here it's got all the information in it's from Pictory application which is where you configure everything um, tells you the no layout, um, summary, input total, output total, and then it starts listing the devices. So in this case, I had a RevPy gate Ethernet IP module connected, uh, and then it goes through each of the devices, inputs and outputs, uh, including their configuration. And in my case, I actually had some settings in here. We'll go through that later, but this is the file that defines all the io and everything so if you have done a lot of work in there you might want to back that up okay so now, now let's go to win32 disk imager and in my case we are connected to drive f which is the drive letter that was presented to us yours may differ so just be careful which one you pick now, in this case, we're going to read and we're going to do a backup. So you pick the folder that you're going to back up to. In my case, it's rather a long file name, but it's in my videos folder where I'm doing shooting this. And I've got a folder for the RevPy 10855 and I've created a file called RevPy 10855 backup.iso. Um, I'm pulling it from the F drive and then you just click on read and you let it get on with it now it may take a few minutes i actually have quite a long lead stretching from my room to another room um, through a couple of usb hubs to then connect to the uh, revolution pi that's sitting in my um well, my workbench so you can see here this will take a little while to happen so i'm going to cancel this for now just assume that it has happened and once it's done, it just gives you the normal Win32 disk imager, backup complete, etc., etc. So I'm just going to cancel out of this. So you would end up with a file, which I've got here. I called it, uh, there's the one that didn't complete. That's why it's so small. So I'll just delete that. End up with a file. It's basically just under four gigabytes in size. And I, it's, you can use this to restore back. So if you've done a lot of work and you want to have a backup, uh, you can get your file here, save it away, bring it back later. Or if you're going to do some changes, you know if you're going to break it. And believe me, you can break the image if you're not careful with your updates and various other things. I know because I did it, unfortunately. And guess what? I learned the hard way, make a backup first because I actually had to recreate what I'd done from scratch because I didn't do this. So once you've downloaded and unzipped the image file um, and you've made your backup, of course, it's time to write the downloaded image to the EMMC flash. So in this case, the current one as of um, February 2019 is the 
July 17th, 2018, uh, revpystretch.img. So I've uh, found that on the folder. I've verified that I'm going to the correct drive letter, which is on your machine, might be different, so be careful. And we just hit write. This takes about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm, I am going through a couple of USB hubs and things like that, so you may be a little bit quicker if you're um, directly connected to your PC. And uh, let's go. I'll uh, pause the video while it happens, and then I'll be right back to you. Okay, 10 minutes has passed, and we have a successful write. So time to unplug the micro USB cable, reboot, and do our initial configuration. So let me just go do that and I'll be right back. Um, one of the things I'll try and do is capture the boot up screen so that we can have the IP address. You can look at your router when it boots up initially, it will grab an IP address. Um, but it also typically will show you on the HDMI output too, I hope. So I will grab a screenshot of that once it's booted up. Uh, the initial process is exactly the same as any other Raspberry Pi. Okay, starting the boot process. Sorry, I'm trying to keep the camera out of shot. Okay, starting the boot. Okay, it's now got the login prompt. Any second now, I'll grab an IP address 192.168.1.218. So that's what we need to browse to. Okay, so the RevPi connect is now booted up. Um, we may be able to connect it. It should, by default, have the Pi and Raspberry for its passwords, but we will need to, um, it will come up with a script because it's the first time it's running. So what I'll use is TerraTerm to connect to it, and we'll just start a new connection, and it's 192.168.218. Two one eight in this case. Um, that's what we just gleaned from the screen. Uh, you could use your router to get this information if you want, and it's going to be SSH, and we should be able to just say OK. So we get our little security warning because it's got a new um, fingerprint. So we'll just say continue for that, and on my other screen pops up. We get the prompt for the username and password. So it should be Pi and Raspberry, and here we are. So it's prompting us immediately for the kind of module we have. In our case, it's the core. So we'll just type in C-O-R-E, enter. Now it wants the serial number. Let me just go get that and put it in. The serial number is actually written on the front of the unit as well. Let me just bring up an image and I'll show you. There we go. So you can see in the bottom right here, just to the right of the barcode, this is the serial number right here. All right, we need to enter that, and then it's going to ask us for the MAC address right here. Let's put in the serial number. I think that is correct from what I'm seeing here. And we press Enter. Now it wants the MAC address. Okay, so here's the MAC address put in, and we press Enter. And should come up with a default password, which it has, it will give you it. It's based on the MAC address. All right, so this should coincide with the password that was originally the default one written on the side of the unit because you've provided the same details. Um, host name is actually changed. So I may change the host name before I'm done. In fact, I'll do that right now because it's changed from what I guess the um, host name was when it first came. So all I want is the short version of the host name, which is RevPi10855. So if I go to just Etsy and sudo nano host name, I should be able to edit this. Probably change in firmware. So RevPi10855 is what I want. That will match what I've got configured in other things. So we'll just control X, yes, enter. All right, so let's put the host name back to what it was. Now we should be able to uh, reboot and connect with the web page and see what we get by default. So let's do that right now. 
So this was what I had before with the modules configured in it. And I did the, um, I actually saved off the configuration. Let's ignore that and we'll just do the refresh. It's going to bring us back to here. Now, I haven't changed the password, so we need to put in this password that it gave us. So, perfect. Now, this is the default RevPy status screen. So, Pictory as a service is enabled automatically. Um, the other tabs here, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail, but I'm just going to quickly show you. So, you can change the clock rate of the CPU if you want. Uh, synchronization daemon for time. Uh, SSH, so it's enabled by default, so we can do exactly what we've been doing. Uh, boot to GUI, I uh, don't want that. And in fact, I'm going to remove um, some of this stuff too, because it takes up a lot of space on the EMMC card. Swap and store logs on, and we'll just leave those alone for the moment. And services, so this is where we can configure a few of these extra services, things like uh, Modbus Master, Slave, these two are virtual devices that work with the core image that has the um, mapping to all of the I.O. through a core process. Uh, RevPy 7 services, Logi art runtime service, uh, Team Viewer if you want to do remote uh, screen, um, Procon and Spider Control. So I'm going to leave these alone. Uh, you've got your basic status, so you've got your internal serial number, your uptime, how, what temperature is the core, voltage, and free disk space. So as you can see here, we've got currently 928 megabytes free. So what we want to do anyway is to go into Pictory. So we'll click Start for Pictory. And here we are. Now this is your default Pictory view. So what we have is a digital I.O. module connected uh, the RevPy Core 3, of course, and we have a uh, gateway Ethernet IP. So we want to build those up. So you start with the core. So here we have the core 1.2. So we drag that onto the screen. Next, we have the digital I.O. And it is a full D.I.O., not just a D.I. or D.O. And that's connected to the left. And to the left of that, we have the Ethernet IP. So we drag that in and drop that. Now, this Ethernet IP gives you Modbus capability and things as well. Um, as a Modbus slave, I haven't seen how to configure it as a Modbus master at this point in time. So anyway, those are your three configurations, uh, modules that we want to have in. Um, <clears throat> I On the DIO, I have a couple of relays connected on uh, output port 0 and 1, so I could preset them to turn on by tweaking these values down in the bottom right here for the ports for that module. Uh, if I go to the DIO, sorry, that you can pick which module you're configuring. So we would, we could set these so the relays actually come on um, by default like that, and then that would set those outputs to be on instead of off when the unit powers up. The gateway module has similar capabilities. These are effectively um, a memory locations. They're registers as far as a Modbus system is concerned. So they're not binary. Uh, they're not bits as you would have for coils. They're just registers. Uh, you've got by default 20 in and 20 output. Now you can change this up here. You drop it down. You can have up to 480. Um, for both. I'm just going to leave it at 20 for now and we'll look at how you use those in another video. And then the RevPy core itself, you have these parameters that are actually available to be interrogated from the um, PyTest application or something else that can talk to the uh, core image as well. So we've got the status, the PIO cycle, any errors, temperature, frequency, uh, the LED status, errors 1 and 2. I think these are binary patterns for errors. This is what you've got once you've configured it. Now, how you save this is you go up to here, you go File, and you if you want it to be used immediately when it starts up again, you click on Save as Start.config. Um, you can also save it to a specific name. So you do Save As. So if we wanted to give this one as a mod 
um, bus underscore demo, then which is what it's going to be, we could save that as well, and it will save it as a different name. So if we wanted to change this and then go back to it, we could just go open and it will show us the Modbus demo. Now it's not going to load this. If we open this, which we could do right here, um, if we rebooted, it won't take effect. You would have to save it as start.config. That is the one that is used for the boot. And that's the one that you can get from the um, slash etc slash revpy folder. Uh, let's have a quick look where that goes. So we've just done this save. And in the WinSCP, we could go to root uh, etc, I think, scroll down to the R's for pqr revpy and in here you can see there's the config.rsc which will now have been updated that's the configuration done now if you want to back this up the configuration that you've done say you've done a lot more and you've got more modules and everything else um, running here then you can go into the folder structure using the winscp as the example um, let me just connect to bring up those again i shut it down for some silly reason um, so you could take this config RSC and uh, drag it to a local file store or something. Uh, then you would have it and you could just drop it back from there once you were done and it would bring up that image after a reboot. Um, when you do configure all of these changes, you want it to become part of the runtime. Right now it's just saved as a config file. What you would do is you go into tools and you would click on reset the driver. And once you do that, the internal um, kernel driver that deals with all of the I.O. will be rebooted. It will read the new configuration, initialize all of the I.O. modules, and then everything will be up and running. That's pretty much it for initializing a module. The I'll show you the connect one that I have. I'm just going to have to re-log into this. It's been a little while, so it's just timed out. It's pretty much the same in this level. So if I go into Pictory though, you'll see that I have the different module picked here, which is the RevPy Connect. And I have an AIO and a DIO. The difference is that I've configured these a little differently. I've got an RTD, an analog input from a temperature sensor, and I have an analog output going to a panel meter. Actually, I've got two analog outputs going to a panel meter that are being used to represent a temperature and humidity from a remote sensor that's connected on Wi-Fi that's actually running on an ESP8266. The DIO module has a encoder on its inputs so that I can twiddle a dial on a rotary encoder and it will count up or count down. So that's how I've got this configured, but we're going to cover all of that in another video when we set up a node red example. Now, before we go, this has got the basic configuration done. The next thing we need to do is update everything. So I'm going to close this video off here because it's going to be quite long already. And the next video will be configuring. And the next video will be upgrading the firmware. So sudo app get update up app get install etc and then we will also take it up to the latest version of node red uh, if we have a look in the image right now you'll see that it is on let me just bring up a terminal session so we can um, do this let's just go back in um, we'll bring up which was when we just did this one here uh, so we say yes to that. So now here's our terminal session. So if I do um, node red dash v, so we you know we're going to spin it up in verbose mode. <coughs> so we're running on version 18.4, and we're actually up to probably version 19. Dot something or a, certainly a later version. Uh, Node.js is a bit out of date as well. Um, the last thing we need to do after you've reflashed the EMMC with a new version of Raspbian with the Kunbus add-ons like the real-time kernel, etc., is to update, upgrade, do a distribution upgrade, and a little bit of cleanup. And I'll show you why after we've just done the first few. Let's just have a look at this first with the drive space or the SD space. If we just do DF, 
and we will see that we're currently using 73% of the SD card. So we've got 950 megabytes free. So we'll do the um, sudo apt-get update, upgrade, and dist upgrade, and we'll see what we have left then. sudo apt-get update. Okay, done. Now upgrade. Okay, looks like we're done. Took a few minutes there. I speeded it up going through that. Uh, next thing to do now is sudo apt get upgrade, uh, dist upgrade, which will bring in any distribution updates. Probably won't take long for this one. So this is actually saying here that it's bringing in node red 0.19.4 to replace the 0.18.4. Okay, so that's the distribution upgrade. So if I actually do a DF now, remember we were at 73% used. So now we are at 83% used. So we've used quite a bit. We've only got um, 500 megabytes left and with logging and things like that, that can get used up pretty quick. Now, if I just start node red right now, We'll see what version it claims that it now has. Okay, so it has taken it up to um, 19.4, 0 0.19.4, which is good. Uh, we're running the browser, so let's just have a quick look at the screen for it. Okay, so yes, we are in 19.4, but we still have no palette manager. So that's not here. And the reason that not, is not here is because we don't have the npm package running so if i actually try let me just stole this right now if i try and do npm um, dash v version right it's not even there and my attempts to load it independently using app get npm things like that resulted in me completely trashing the environment so i did a bit of googling and the actual answer is right on Raspberry Pi's website. They actually have a script, a curl um, bash script that fixes all of that for you. Uh, it takes a little while to run, but it actually updates everything and it installs all the bits that you need as well. So um, I'll provide all these in the descriptions, but here it is, we're just gonna run it now. So it's gonna remove the old Node.js uh, anything prior to version 7 and node red and then replace them with the latest versions um, so we'll just say yes so you can see here it's stopping node red it's removing well there's a list of what it's going to do right there so you just have to wait for it to finish its job and it will actually bring everything up to date distribution upgrade did upgrade node red but it didn't enable the things like npm and stuff like that hopefully in a future release they'll have that included by default all right, I'll come back to this once it has got to near the end. Okay, didn't take very long at all. Nice and done. All right, so we do have an NPM now, 6.7, which I think is the current as of right now. And if we start node red, which is what I was originally intending to do, we should get version, there we go. We actually got one step further up. We've got 19.5 now. So we're all up and running there. So let's go back to the browser and see what version we have here now just to confirm there it is 19.5 and now we also have the palette manager which is excellent so i'm just going to shrink that down again for a second and kill it because i want to see what space we now have left after all of that so we've used 86 percent so we didn't use much in that operation but that's still only leaving us 500 meg and I've already had one instance where I um, ran out of space so there is a command that can actually free up a reasonable amount of space if you're not intending to use the desktop environment which I'm not and that is that you can run uh, sudo app remove raspberry pi ui mods which will remove 
uh, quite a bit of the UI environment if you were going to run a local desktop. There were a couple of other files, well one mainly, that helped to remove a significant amount of space which is the high color icon themes. I tried removing things like the LX terminal and stuff like that uh, but they were all either generating errors or not wanting to come out. But I did remove the high color themes and that actually took us back down to 79% uh, used and I don't know if an apt get clean will do anything more but it might. Ooh, look at that. Down to 69%. So there you go. Um, that's got back up to a gigabyte of free space now without any loss of functionality. So if I just do the sudo reboot just to make sure everything comes up properly. A few things screaming at me now. Let's just close that out. Um, what I'm going to wait for is to see that this node red actually comes back to me, which it should do. And of course, Pictory with this same configuration still there. So we'll just give that a moment and then I'll hit the refresh again on node red and we'll see what we get. It's finally detected that the uh, underlying host has gone away. Should probably be up by now. Yep, that's back. So that's good. And Pictory should be back. Probably going to prompt me to log in again. Nope, it remembered the credentials. It wasn't too long, just a reboot. So there we are and looks like we still got our configuration here. So it looks like we're good. Um, yeah, just after that reboot, let me just check that the space has remained away. Sorry, <laughs> that we still have all of our space. So quick DF. And yep, we still got our 69% used only. So we've still got 30% free, which is uh, reasonable. Uh, just to let you also know that um, with the release of the new Raspberry Pi compute modules, there are now um, probably going to be some upgrades available or newer versions of the RevPi Connect and Core 3 coming out that will have 8, 16, and 32 gig of EMMC flash. So that's all good news. Now, for those upgrades to show up in actual product may take a while because obviously they'll have to go through testing and everything else. But I do know from the Raspberry Pi site that the speed has been improved from 1.2 to 1.4 gigahertz. It's still four cores. And as I said, the three flash sizes have been increased um, or made available. So not just four now, you've got 8, 16 and 32 gig. So we're able to run reasonably comfortably in four here. And that's with the full blown desktop top type of install. Obviously with an 8, 16 or 32 gig EMMC flash, you won't have to remove things to make space. You could just leave them there and turn on and off the services as you need. So that's it. Now I'm really going. Bye.